Warning, this week's episode contains hornets. I'm kidding, they're cuss words. This week's episode of The Scathing Atheist is brought to you by Adam and Eve, and by the fact that 2020 hasn't unleashed the atrocity badgers yet. Atrocity badgers, you know they're coming as much as you know we deserve them. And now, The Scathing Atheist. Hi, my name is Emery, and I just wanted to say, as a person who worked in customer service for a decade and is now estranged from her parents after coming out as trans, I can assure you that we did evolve from filthy monkey people. It's June 11th. And it's King Kamehameha Day. Huh. I'm No Illusions. I'm Heath Enright. And from Cincinnati Swing State and Plague Bowling, Georgia, this is The Skating Atheist. On this week's episode, Eli's slack-ass baby won't even have applied for a job yet. The Milwaukee Police Department might be willing to die for our <laughs> sins. And Hillary Morgan Ferrer will remain an idiot. But first, the diatribe. I said it online the day after baby Bosnick was born, but I kind of picture Anna and Eli leaving the hospital like that scene at the end of Children of Men, right, where the war stops so they can get the baby out. I mean, I know that the chaotic images and shit were mostly just Republican propaganda, and I'm super happy for them, but holy fuck, what a world to bring a baby into. You know, there's there's this part of you that can't help but look around at the social unrest and the bigotry and the pandemic and the racist in chief and think, is this the best we could do for baby Bosnick? Is this the best world we have to offer him? Or even worse, are we counting on him to fix it? And paradoxically, that's a really good sign that he's coming into the world at a great moment. I mean, I I have this, you know, what a world to be born into attitude because that's the way I'm conditioned to look at it. Sure, things are full-blown shit right now, but ultimately it's not like there's some other historic era where a kid's better off being born, right? I mean, there are problems of plenty in the world, but like for the dentistry alone, you'd pick this era if you had a menu, right? I I don't know about you, but I'd much rather have been born into a world where VR porn was already being perfected when I was a baby. Look, I'm not trying to let the present off the hook by pointing out how much worse the past was. The present still needs to get its shit together. But the very concept of societal progress is, if you think about it, pretty new. You know, back in medieval days, there was no sense that one generation was supposed to have it better than the last one. Life for the son was the same as life for the father was the same as life for the grandfather. And let's not even fucking talk about life for the daughter. Humanity's best times were in the past and all the future generations had to look forward to was the apocalypse and its accompanying bridal high blood tsunami. It took secular society to even comprehend the idea of social progress. Right. I mean, and that's not just some historical coincidence that secularism just happened to have going for it. Humanism is literally a prerequisite. As long as you're stuck in a theological worldview, especially a monotheistic one, the world is exactly as God wants it to be. Our misery and suffering are exactly how much God thinks we deserve. To attempt to thwart that would be sacrilegious. You know, and that's not just theoretical. We have centuries of history to back this up. Society started getting better precisely around the time we realized that nobody was going to help. You have to set God aside to get there. Before that, there was never any notion that one generation would leave the next generation a better world. Now we see it as dereliction of duty if we don't at least try. Of course, the desire to create a better world doesn't always make a better world, right? There are competing ideas of what a better world looks like. If you're a progressive liberal... It looks a hell of a lot different than if you're a fucking racist Oompa Loompa. But even the bad guys are generally motivated by misguided and even diabolical efforts to improve the world. Right. And sure, religious leaders and groups have reluctantly climbed onto this historical bandwagon. And now they say they want to make a better world, too. But when you dig into what they mean by that, it's usually a desire to retreat back into the past rather than the move forward into the future. You know, the fact that we want to leave our children a better world is ultimately proof that we have. 
or at least that you know somebody has along the way. And sure, not everything moves forward in lockstep, and it certainly doesn't move at the same speed for all the people. But better just means not as bad as this. And <laughs> that's a pretty low bar to clear, even if this is the best we've ever managed as a species. Right? Like, it looks bad. A lot of it is bad, but but a lot of it also isn't, right? I, I, I called it social unrest earlier, and as negative as the connotations around that term are, it's not a negative term, right? A society resting when shit was this bad would be the reprehensible thing. Social unrest is, when successful, synonymous with social reform. The protests going on right now are terrifying if you're an old white evangelical Republican, but they're liberating if you're virtually anything else. And as baby Bosnick's mother would be happy to explain, I'm sure, giving birth to something new is painful, even if the thing you're giving birth to is beautiful. They're talking about your Jesus. We interrupt this broadcast to bring you a special news bulletin. Joining me for headlines tonight is the only other guy here, Heath Enright. Heath. Are we ready to make Dr. Pepper the official beverage of the scathing atheist and Zipline <laughs> its official pastime? Done. That is canon forever now. Also, Francis Bacon, our official playwright. Damn right. That's locked in. Damn right. And speaking of how Eli can go fuck himself, it's time for a word from this week's sponsor, <laughs> Adam and Eve. Hey, Heath, you know what the best part of staying home is? Is it sex toys? It is sex toys. And during yes. lockdown, you never even have to put them up. Uh, right, right, which which you would do. You would put them away because... Uh, be, because so that, people might come over. Because people might come over to, it, to your house. It, exactly, that's something that, yeah. that everybody and right has now, in life. You can take advantage of your downtime with 50% off any one item at adamandeve.com. I'm not sure what I'm going to do with half a butt plug, but that, that's nice of them, I guess. Right? No, 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 the, the, uh, the price is half off. Oh, Okay. I mean, like, I'd figure something out with, with half of it. But no, I know. No I, I know that saying. you would. Yeah. Plus, when you order, you also get 10 free boredom-busting gifts, including six spicy movies, a three-piece bonus kit, and a, a tenth thing. And best of all, huh. free shipping delivered discreetly right to your door. But you have to remember to use the offer code SCATHING. That's SCATHING at checkout. Okay, I'm not sure, though. I have some very specific sex toy needs no problem adam and eve has thousands of products to make you glad you're staying at home sex toys make being at home so enjoyable hell even shopping from home is better when you're shopping for sex toys so go to adamandeve.com right now and use our offer code scathing to get 50 percent off plus your 10 bonus gifts adam and eve because usually when i ask is it sex toys in the middle of an ad noah edits that out i know right not this time oh. it is sex toys it was bound to be eventually. You ask enough times. And now back to the headlines. In our lead story tonight, we're going to lash back at backlash, 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 backlash. We're going five layers okay. deep. Eat your fucking heart out, Leonardo DiCaprio. I'm so, already lost. Right. No, I'll help. I'll help. So backlash number one is the nationwide and even global protest against institutionalized racism that were sparked by the murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis. The backlash to that was a petulant president harumphing his way out of his fucking bunker through a war crime so that he could hold a Bible upside down and backwards and talk about <laughs> cracking heads in front of a church. I was showing it to somebody upside down behind me. It's not... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Batman might have been there. Not you weird. never know. He hangs upside down sometimes. Um, now, the backlash <laughs> to that, uh, don't worry, the odd numbers are the good ones, was religious leaders going, come on, man, don't make it that obvious that our whole thing is a fiction now co-opted by a heartless ruling class to add a hint of medieval divine blessing to their rule and the backlash to that <laughs> is what i'm going to talk about in this headline All right. and the backlash to that oh, is the fact that i'm going to talk about it in the headline are we ready <laughs> okay I, I, i'm i'm more lost where am i doodly do doodly do doodly do doodly do I don't know what level you I'm can't on. doodly do out of this one. I'm sorry, you man. Can't, uh, <laughs> All right. Ood, you'll dude. Yes. So, so we're going to start off with conservative pundit, president of the Phyllis Schlafly Eagles, and man only a paternity leave away from being the subject of a necrophilia joke. Ed Martin <laughs> sent a <laughs> strongly more. worded letter to Catholicism this week after Archbishop of D.C. Wilton Gregory condemned Trump's photo op at the John Paul II shrine. He went on to describe Gregory's statement as, quote, classic American social justice gobbledygook and said okay. it was, quote, damaging to the body of christ 
Oh, was it? Yeah, real sorry about that. We'll give the son of God a trigger warning next right. time. You know, just in case he can't handle all the tawdry blue social justice talk that we're always throwing out. It Sorry really is the fucking crown of thorns and spear of rhetoric. Yes. And by the way, snowflake God, <laughs> because I absolutely cannot leave Phyllis Schlafly Eagles just kind of hanging out there without explanation. Not. That's ridiculous. <laughs> so that is a right wing already no tank that uses Phyllis's memory to shit <laughs> on immigrants and be racist misogynist, which to be fair is exactly what she would have wanted. And also they named themselves after a first grade reading group that they weren't, <laughs> you know, quite smart enough to be part of when they were six. So they got some lingering resentment. No, they were canary readers. But yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, you guys were in the rhinos. You were in the cartoon rhinos. That's okay. Not everybody was an eagle in there. Oh, yeah, so. No, they read, they read pretty good. Though. <laughs> you guys are well readers, right? <laughs> I've also got another story on the subject from uh, Fox News pastor and man with very convincing toupee that I haven't noticed at all, Robert Jeffress. He was also unimpressed with the condemnation of the way Trump dry humped the Bible on TV and pointed out that all presidents had to deal with accusations like that. For example, according to Jeffress, quote, actual fucking quote. This is bananas. This is George so much Washington so go ahead. It's had so his share of critics who accused him of a photo op when he What's knelt that? down in prayer at Valley Forge. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And according to the timeline established there, that's also why George Washington never got another job as an NFL quarterback. <laughs> yep. So, Drew Brees gets it. Yeah. Asshole. Even if you forgive the fact that he's half a century early on photography, even existing, let alone <laughs> photo ops existing. Right. It's, it's also worth noting that he's talking about a fictitious event that only happened in a fucking painting. Right. Or like, I mean, Washington, no doubt, kneeled at some point or another while he was at Valley Forge. But the fucking painting Jeffress is referencing isn't of some historical event. It's just some fucking Christian nationalist painting that Robert Jeffress has jerked off to so much that he doesn't know it's not real anymore. <laughs> and come on, man. Washington's disrespecting the forge there. That's weird that you would think that's positive. <laughs> and next up in headlines. It's been over two weeks since George Floyd was murdered, and it felt like the Christian right was really slacking on their false flag conspiracy game. I mean, we do these things all the time. You'd think they'd start piecing it together a little faster now. Right. But they eventually realized just how perfect the plan it was to set up murder so we could distract everyone from the liberal atheist plot to take over the world. And also... Already controls the world. Yep. Both. Yeah, exactly. We're, we're more now mm. controlling it. And it was Cynthia Bream, the chair of the Bexar County, Texas Republican Party, who broke the story. She made a post on Facebook suggesting that Floyd's murder was, quote, a filmed public execution with the purpose of creating racial tensions and driving a wedge in the growing group of anti deep state sentiment. Yeah, right. Because when modern American liberal conspirators looked around their nation in hopes of finding some source of racial tension, ah, I got they nothing. gave up Drew Straws and staged <laughs> some racism. Yeah. Yeah. And the Post also followed up on Bream's claim from last month that COVID-19 is a democratic hoax. But those, you know, 100,000 American deaths just weren't theatrical enough for mm -hmm. us. Yeah. So we moved on to one more murder, but flashier and with LSD involved. Really? Her post. Yeah. I'm going to connect those dots for you. Her post went on to suggest that the police officers who were involved in that murder were victims of MK Ultra activation. <laughs> those <laughs> Minneapolis police officers who <laughs> murdered George Floyd were activated by MK Ultra. Just to be clear, that's the CIA program with all the crazy drugs they gave everybody, mostly LSD. She thinks there was an extremely precise murder conspiracy done by the liberal atheists carried out by cops who were tripping on acid unbeknownst to them. 
since 1973. Yeah, it's a <laughs> it's a long con. It's a, it's a long fuse on that acid sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. So the LSD thing is obviously ridiculous, but Bream does seem to know about the ultimate goal of our plan, which is, of course, to discredit Donald Trump. Now that he's become so popular with the black community, that's a big problem for us liberals. Yeah, well, yeah. No, it is. She knows we've been desperately looking for an example of a white cop killing a black person and that we never found one. And she knows we've also been desperately looking for a way to finally make Trump look bad during an election year when he's otherwise been crushing it. So you know, she's on to us. Yeah. Does she think we have a really convincing marionette and somebody who does the voice? I mean... <laughs> <laughs> so there, there there is a little bit of good news to go along with this story first of all bream's post definitely forced alex jones to rewrite a whole episode of infowars that was coming out the next day and he was super pissed about getting scooped also some republicans didn't like her post including a few that are even calling for her to resign huh so congrats to the gop i guess <clears throat> for having like gradations of more and less evil. Great job with that. Although she did already claim I'm definitely not resigning. So that's not changing, I guess. Bottom line, though, this is who a bunch of evangelical Christian people in Texas are willing to elect. Right. Bream thinks a secret atheist cabal manufactured a global pandemic. But then we figured it was running out of steam after a few months so we created an acid-fueled snuff film to keep the anti-Trump sentiment going because that was going to go away. But she's pro-life, so end the conversation. Yeah. That's who they're voting for. Yep, and she Fuck knows you. all about two Corinthians. <laughs> and in AOKKK news tonight, Jerry Falwell Jr. found still another worse a couple weeks ago as though he was a completionist in a video game called Asshole. <laughs> <laughs> this came in the form of an attempted joke involving a KKK outfit and blackface, so it's hard to imagine how an evangelical Christian could fuck this up, uh, but he managed. Did he? Yeah, in response uh. to Virginia's state mandate on wearing face masks, Falwell bitched like a five-year-old that doesn't want a bath, then threatened to wear a mask featuring that infamous image of Virginia Governor Ralph Northam in blackface, an <sighs> image he finds so offensive that he included it on a face mask to punctuate his fucking joke. Yeah, okay. I know you're way too dumb to get this, Jerry Falwell Jr., but when a bigot is both figuratively and very literally hiding behind satire <laughs> without realizing it, that's pretty funny. It's you. It's mostly sad, right, but no, it's also mostly, funny because you're dumb. Mostly and sad. Awful and a bigot. Yeah, so, of course, regardless of what his intentions were, what he objectively did was tweet out a picture of a guy in KKK garb next to a white man in blackface right below a bad effort at a nyuk, nyuk, nyuk. And that led to the resignation of one of Liberty's black professors, which has to be a significant fucking percentage. Yeah. As well as an open letter from more than 30 black alumni demanding Falwell's resignation. Again, probably a pretty significant percentage. Hmm. You think he should resign? Let's hold on. Let's. Let's check with the philosophy department to see what's the ethical thing. <laughs> yeah, to right. Do. Oh, no, they don't exist. Mm. Nothing there. So while you're resigning, despite your, of course, amazing positive intentions about racial diversity, maybe set up an African studies department for the very fucking first yeah. time at your university, asshole. Good luck. Well, okay, so after seeing that people were too stuck up to get his hilarious joke, Falwell took to Twitter to offer up a half ass apology in which he referenced conversations with many black friends that didn't find it offensive at all, explain how racist he wasn't at all being, doubles down on the but Northam is the real racist rhetoric, and then, of course, gets to the but it's still your fault for not getting to it part of the apology, which, by the way, didn't even bother to touch on the fact that the racism was just a frame that he was placing around his effort to try to get people to disregard public health measures. <sighs> Jesus. And while fucking Falwell sets off for another corrupt seed of bigotry, we'll hand things over to my lovely wife, Lucinda. A man wrote the Bible. A whore is what she was. If it's a legitimate race. It makes you a slut, right? It, cooking can be fun. Hey, I'm proud of a man. This week in Massage. All right. I know we're not in the habit of talking about happy stories on this segment, but I want to warn you up front that this week's stories are going to be particularly brutal. 
And I won't blame you at all if you want to just skip ahead a couple of minutes and miss out on the worst of it. And time to do that is running out fast because our first story is about a man decapitating his child. So this is the horrible and tragic story of Ramina Ashrafi, an Iranian teenager murdered by her father who will, at most, spend 10 years in prison for this heinous and premeditated crime. But her story doesn't start being horrible then by any means. The 14-year-old had drawn an online reputation for pushing back against religious strictures with incendiary shit like letting her hair show from behind her face veil and posting pictures of her online in jeans and a t-shirt. When her dad found out, in addition to all of that, she also had a boyfriend. He called a lawyer and asked what kind of punishment he'd get if he murdered her. And if that's not fucked up enough by itself, the lawyer then explained that because he was her father, he'd be looking at 10 years at most. Normally, murder comes with a death penalty in Iran. But under Sharia law, that doesn't count if your victim is your child or your grandchild. And you're a man. Let's be super clear. If the mom did it, she would be executed. Now, the crime did gain a lot of national attention, and even Iranian conservatives found it appalling possibly at least partly because he committed the crime with a farming sickle. And while even religious conservatives have condemned the crime, they still defend the law that basically gave her dad permission to do it. And I'm sad to tell you that I can't guarantee you that that that's the most fucked up story I've got this week. Because my next story is about a father in Egypt who tricked his daughters into FGM by telling them that they were getting vaccinated for the coronavirus. Now, to be clear, that's illegal in Egypt and has been for a depressingly brief 12 years. So the dad was arrested for this, but that's really only because their mom didn't go along with it. Despite the laws, some experts estimate that as many as half of Egyptian girls are still subjected to this kind of barbarity. And according to the BBC, so far, not one single person has been successfully prosecuted under the law. Now, normally after subjecting you to two stories that bad, I try to offer up a little good news to ease you back into the headlines. But I'm afraid the best I can do for you this time around is some less gruesome bad news. It looks like an appeals court just tossed out the challenge Satanist issued against Missouri's bullshit abortion waiting period. The original suit argued that the restrictive law violates the satanic principle that one's body is inviolable and subject only to one's own will, which the law clearly does. So if we were all being subjected to the same rules, this would be a slam dunk win for abortion rights. Needless to say, it wasn't. So with the eternal but unwarranted optimism that maybe I'll have some good news to offer up next week, I'll hand things back over to Noah and Heath. Thank you, Lucinda. Next up in headlines in Money is Powell News. You remember that Pastor Matt Powell guy who... Technically owes us $150,000, possibly more, after we made fun of his terrible movie on GAM and he had a big meltdown and and he directly stole our copyrighted audio and <laughs> put it on his YouTube channel. And and then Andrew got all squeaky and excited oh, and yeah, had to talk yeah. him down and rub his belly for a little bit. <laughs> yeah, well, we decided not to sue that guy because, well, I mean, he looks like a nine-year-old, so we felt bad. And he clearly has no money, so it probably wouldn't have been useful in the first place. Well, it looks like Matt Powell might have made several dollars from a speaking engagement recently. Wait a minute. Uh, Granted, he definitely spent most of that windfall on a set of iPod shuffles to film the event with a professional (laughs) three-camera setup. (laughs) Oh, oh, right. Okay, yeah. But we still might want to consider that lawsuit again, mostly just for spite. Also, for three iPod shuffles, though, that's pretty Yeah, I mean, I could use the iPods. That's true. (laughs) Either way. Either way. But a lot for spite, too. And that's because he gave a sermon entitled The Atheist Religion, in all caps, during which he claimed that 99% of school shootings are done by atheists. Huh. Uh, you know what? Knowing Matt Powell as we do, the simple fact he's admitting to, that they're not false flag events, that exceeds my expectations. I'm proud of him. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's kind of impressive on the logic scale that I would apply to him. So the sermon is an hour long, which is, you know, just under the length of his anti-evolution movie, Science Falsely So-Called. And the whole sermon is fucking bananas. I tried to watch it. But then I started punching myself in the face and I lost interest in the video. Yeah, right. Hemant Mehta, however, 
did complete the masochism homework, as he is wont to do. He does a lot of the homeworks. He's good with this stuff, very diligent. So I'll give you a few of the highlights that Hammett listed, starting in minute two, when Powell said, quote, atheists couldn't even tell you what one of the Ten Commandments are. Sick. He meant one of the commandments is. Turns out one is singular. <laughs> I, I know that's tricky. That's a tricky one. It's like data, datum kind that's, of. The, yeah, right. Yeah, that's some tricky one in Matt Powell's week. Plus, you know, the verb to be, that's pretty obscure. <laughs> it's hard to conjugate. Plural, singular. I, I don't know. But apparently we can't even name a single commandment burn right in our face. Well, we, we can't list a single one plurally anyway, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> also, how would us not knowing their silly ass pool rules be relevant, even <laughs> if it was true? I, I don't know. Anyway, moving ahead to minute four, when Powell read a Dawkins quote about how religion can poison your mind. And then Powell got visibly distraught about the quote that he chose to read. His face got all red and it starts fucking red. It got extra red. And then he argued back against the quote he chose to read. Is that why 99% of school shootings are done by atheists? Yet Christians have never committed such an act. Oh, exact words. Huh? Oh, okay. We're, we're doing bullshit. Okay. Well then I'll see your bullshit and raise 99% of school shootings were committed by Matt Powell. Boom. <laughs> Balls in your court, bitch. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go even further. 101% of school shootings <laughs> were committed by Matt Powell. Oh, shit. 102% isn't more than that. There's nowhere for you to go, man. You did some future ones. And <laughs> that brings us to minute eight, which is where Matt Powell accidentally described a giant problem with creationism but he subbed in the word evolution instead. Quote, evolution is the only theory that's protected by law. Wait, what? And let me ask you something. If your theory has to be protected by law, what does that tell you about hmm. your theory? It can't undergo any scrutiny. Hmm. You are. End huh. quote. Anyway, so I'm constitutionally exempt from taxes. How neat is that? <laughs> Fuck you. So confused. It's the best. All the way you are. Yeah, so, Matty P, I know you're listening. I know we say that a lot, but I know you actually Yeah, actually you really are. Because <laughs> you're weird, and you're probably stealing this audio right now, and we might actually <laughs> sue you. So, here's what we need you to realize. Here's what we need you to do to make some money so that we can sue you and get more than those those shuffles. You have 60 minutes of amazing new material. I know, I just watched uh, a few clips of that, but there were 60 minutes there. That's a feature-length Christian movie. It is. It's time to make your big, homophobic, anti-evolution sequel. We'll even give you a title. You ready? <gasps> Hedwig and the Angry Finch. Make it fucking happen. <laughs> Do it. We'll even kick in some full-size iPod touches oh, for you to shit. film on. Please, <laughs> please make another movie. Please. Oh, yeah, at least just sometime before we do another live show. Between now and then, please. <laughs> And in mega fool me once news tonight, Tanzania joined New Zealand this week in celebrating the nation's full eradication of COVID-19, though unfortunately they did not join New Zealand in actually eradicating it. No. Tanzanian no, President didn't. John Megafuli, who is basically Trump, but competent enough to do it and competent enough to name African nations without making any of them up, has declared his country to be free of the novel coronavirus because of the state-mandated prayer regimen he instituted back in March. Okay. Um, hate to give you notes after all that amazing work, John Magafuli, but maybe work the phrase and cure HIV into your magic spell somewhere. <laughs> I'm just, just a thought. Oh, if you're doing magic on some stuff with give him spells ideas and other Horrible shit disease. he can ignore. Yeah, so since his declaration that they'd be taking the prayer-only approach to public health, Magafuli has cracked down heavily on opposition, arresting critics, tapping phones, dismissing positive test results as tainted, and obviously refusing to take any concrete steps to keep his citizenry safe from the deadly contagion. In fact, one of his supporters urged the populace to take to the streets to thank God for keeping them safe from the virus. 
because what? I assume you can't point out how full of shit your president is when you're on a ventilator. Yeah, and meanwhile, Magafuli is working on a national cleanup effort to prevent the spread of cholera like an asshole instead of just using more magic. That cleanup <laughs> work is exhausting. <laughs> yeah, right? Cleaning up water everywhere. Come on. Now, to be clear, Tanzania is fucking crawling with coronavirus cases, right? Kenyan authorities test people coming in and out of their country, and they're catching cases of COVID-19 among Tanzanian truck drivers at the rates of dozens a day. Outside authorities are saying it's one of the continental hotspots and the growth rate is exponential. So just a reminder that nobody who ever told you to rely on prayer was helping, and most of them also weren't trying. Right. And apparently he knows about, like, real fixing diseases too and he's doing it's nonsense horrible terrible yeah yeah and finally tonight according to milwaukee police chief alfonso morales law enforcement officers all over the country are being crucified the plight of being a cop right now is just like the torture and murder of jesus christ uh, According to Alfonso Morales. A, a grossly exaggerated and possibly entirely fictitious fantasy propagated by conservative liars in order to maintain control of an increasingly corrupted <laughs> system. Because if that, because if that's what he meant, I'm in. He's right. Nailed it. That's He's a great. Not aware of any analogy. way in which his stupid thing worked. No. Okay. So Morales was giving a press conference about all the protests, and he walks up to the mic, all excited about the amazing opener he wrote for himself, and he says, "Quote: Two thousand years ago." An angry mob came before people. <laughs> he, he made it almost 10 words before forgetting his line. Oh, and then he, he had to just say people. 2,000 years ago, an angry mob came before people to say, crucify that man. That man being Jesus Christ. <laughs> I've got a Jesus levels of rough right now is, <laughs> is what I am saying to yes! Christians on purpose. On purpose. Into a <laughs> microphone. So <laughs> Morales delivers that ridiculous remark. And as you might expect, a room full of reporters all responded, fucking what? Right? And that's when someone from the police communication office violently hip checked Morales away from the podium and tried to start doing damage control. But one of the reporters who is a hero was like, ah, uh, no, absolutely not. We're not moving past that. Chief Morales, uh, get back to the mic. There you go. Who exactly is being crucified? And that's, that's when Morales went back to the mic while his handlers all scream, whispered, don't fucking answer. Just walk away. Just walk. go to your room. Go to your fucking room. Go to your room. Go to your room. Go to your room. He did not. He ignored all that and responded, quote, law enforcement throughout our nation. Law enforcement is being crucified. I doubled down. I, I got crucified so hard the other night, a couple nights ago, by a Canadian protester. You don't know her. <laughs> you don't know her, but uh, she's crucified the fuck out of me. Yeah. So let's let's be super generous and assume Morales was just going for the figurative use of crucified there. As in, the police are being figuratively n nailed to a cross through their arms and legs. Still mm -hmm, dumb, yeah. but l let's assume that's what he was going for. First of all, Yeah. Because of the murdering. Fucking deal with right, it. yes. You're getting figuratively murdered in retaliation for real murder. That's a fucking great deal. <laughs> Be happy. But setting that aside, this whole thing of casually invoking Jesus like that needs to stop being useful and just stop being done at all. He was clearly trying to go for that thing where, where somebody says, well, this reminds me of the story of a simple handyman. His name was Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And like, yeah, whatever sitcom character Morales was watching the night before won the episode with that stupid fucking speech. But that's nothing. Jesus was at best an obnoxious hippie who accidentally created a bigot cult, which, by the way, is a giant source of the entire problem that led to all the protesting that we're fucking talking about. Right. Also, can we stop pretending that Jesus had a trademark on crucifixion? For fuck's sake, he wasn't even the only guy that got crucified on that hill that day. Nope. Right? I mean, according to the story, he had the easiest goddamn flesh wound of a crucifixion ever recorded in the annals of fucking history. And before anybody defends the story by pointing out how innocent Jesus was, they need to acknowledge that they're implying that some of the motherfuckers had a crucifixion coming. Right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, Barnabas, he was... He was... Yeah. <laughs> 
but a little rah, rah, you know what I'm saying. And just for the record, later that day, right after those remarks, we learned that the communications guy who threw the hip check probably wouldn't have made it any better by taking the mic. Obviously, he wanted Morales to shut the fuck up so the department could then lie about what that ridiculous comment was supposed to mean. And you'd also assume apologize as part of that statement. But instead, the department released the following comment, quote, Chief Morales simply compared the mob like mentality seen throughout the past eight days to the mobs that were present during early civilization when Jesus Christ was alive. At no point did he compare the death of Jesus Christ to the attacks on Milwaukee Police Department officers. Uh, uh, except, yes, he fucking yeah, did. That's exactly what he did. Yes, what are you talking about? Right. And also, like, that's that's so still not good, even if that lie was true. Like, uh, you right. wasn't saying that he was like, he was just saying that y'all were like a bunch of you know, pre-civilized barbarians from the Bronze Age is what he was saying. Because <laughs> you're taking it all personally. Oh, good. Yeah, you smoothed it right the fuck over. Good job. So, listen, Chief Morales, probably soon to be ex-Chief Morales, hopefully. Yeah. Listen. I get it. Metaphors are difficult. Same thing with similes and analogies. You're trying to find words that go with other words. There's so many fucking words. It's really hard. <laughs> and meanwhile, your employees are committing hate crimes. And, and then you think of a perfect comparison about a, a Jewish mob who killed the Messiah. But then you realize you shaved your old man's softball mustache a little too thin this week. So you're feeling kind of Hitlery. But you're definitely being persecuted. While well, you think of more words, it's hard. It's really, really hard. Words are hard. Metaphors and similes and analogies. Honestly, they're the crucifixion of word thinking. It's so <laughs> difficult. I- I'm so sorry about how hard it is for you right now coming up with words. You're being crucified. And, and quick, while we sort out who gets the 30 pieces of silver, right, we're going to close the headlines for the night. Heat, <laughs> thanks as always. Jumanji. And when we come back, our past selves will visit from a better time. Before Eli dipped out for paternity leave, we stocked up on a couple extra C segments so that while he was taking care of his new baby, Eli could tune in to hear what he sounded like before he had to clean baby shit out of his beard three times a day. So we're going to go ahead and reach back in time for one of those, specifically chapter 11 of Hillary Morgan Ferrer's book, Mama Bear Apologetics, the chapter about pluralism. <laughs> before we begin, I should point out that this week's chapter is written by Catherine S. Busey. A former NASA engineer who who got (laughs) tired of all the atheism in science and decided to stop having to check her work. She's the author of the book (laughs) Teaching Others to Defend Christianity, which is basically like (laughs) Mama Bear Apologetics, but, you know, with less pastel tones. Uh I keep losing arguments Thanksgiving. The book. book. (laughs) Anyway, her chapter will be titled Just Worship Something Pluralism. That's right. Buckle in, boys, because we're taking on other religions, beliefs existing in Uh this chapter. Wow. Pluralism is the bad guy here. Mm -hmm. That means, by definition, the good guy is totalitarianism. That's what those (laughs) words fucking mean. Yeah. (laughs) And by the way, when Christian white people make that argument, it's called I'm a Nazi. Yeah, (laughs) especially in a book about their bigotry. I mean, don't get me wrong. As dumb as it is when you spell it out with all the religious symbols, coexist is still a societal imperative, right? Oh, (laughs) yeah. Just you wait, Henry Higgins. So, yeah, we're going to (laughs) open up with Catherine telling us how great it is to go from NASA to teaching AP calculus and apologetics at a Christian high school, Mm. which is kind of like name dropping that Tom Cruise once punched you in the face so hard you crapped your pants. (laughs) (laughs) But it's it's more like telling that story right after crapping yourself from getting punched in the face by Colton Haynes, right? One time. (laughs) Correct. Correct. But her point is to set up the clumsy metaphor that letting other people have religious beliefs is like if, as a math teacher, when all the students got a different answer, she gave everyone a hundred, saying, quote, it's not just that many people have different religious ideas, but that they make truth claims, even contradicting ones, and assert they are equally valid. That is the problem. (laughs) Hey, Kathy, I think you're 
math magisterium might have overlapped with your magic magisterium. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, the your fucking the metaphor doesn't work, lady. Religious pluralism would be like if all the kids use different methods to arrive at the same incorrect answer. <laughs> right. So now it's time for a brief history of religious pluralism. And spoiler, it is not just, you know, other religions exist. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to start with Catherine's very revealing definition of the First Amendment. Quote, the U.S. government cannot forbid you from practicing whatever religion you want so long as you don't impose in some way on other people. Meaning you probably wouldn't be allowed to practice a religion that sacrifices young virgins to a volcano god. Probably. <laughs> Otherwise, you could worship as you please. Okay, well, first of all, Scientology is legal. Yeah, That's right. Legal. <laughs> also, the fact that biblical genocide doesn't involve volcanoes, eh, not quite as exculpatory as Catherine seems to think here. Yeah, right, right. No, the problem with sacrificing virgins isn't that they're virgins. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> no, we only do it with sluts and rocks. <laughs> this is, these are the mines of Moria, not a volcano. Technically, it's not active. Yeah, so then she bitches for like a paragraph and a half about the good old days of the pilgrims when... Everyone was either a Christian or on fire. But today, <laughs> according to Catherine, at least, only 46% of Americans claim to be Christian and only 10% no, of Americans say they hold on to a biblical worldview. Fucking okay. what? Uh, it's actually about 75% that yeah. identify yep. as Christian. Uh, 46 was close, though. I mean... You know, with within an order of magnitude. So good job. Well, yeah, no, I, 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 you know, it's good enough for AP Christian mathematics in high school. <laughs> Gee, I wonder why she doesn't math for NASA anymore. She likes it better. She likes it better. <laughs> Everyone loves teaching high school. They say that. <laughs> and in case you're thinking, hey, Kathy, is the point of your last paragraph that having other religions in America is bad? Don't worry. She's way ahead of you. Quote. Pluralism isn't the problem, though. The fact that there are multiple religions around us simply tells us there is ample opportunity for sharing the Christian faith with others. And oh, yeah, well, right. No, if yeah. this problem didn't exist, we couldn't fix it. <laughs> nope. A lot of people, that's not the problem. It's just, That's all the more people to convert and murder with a virus. Well, it's there positive. you go. <laughs> <laughs> opportunity. But sadly, not everyone sees it that way. Some people... Like us fat motherfuckers <laughs> use secularism <laughs> and separation of church and state to try and ruin everything. Or as Catherine puts it, secularism colored with tolerance. Uh, phrasing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> leads to the false dichotomy. You guys ready for a false dichotomy here? Okay. That either one, all religions are equally valid or two, no religion should be discussed. End quote. <laughs> okay. So she's cool with intolerant secularism got it yeah cool. right right there by the way lady there's no reason for an or between those two yeah it's a <laughs> <laughs> so now it's time to roar like a mother an acronym so labored and painful to heath that it almost makes reading this book worthwhile <laughs> <laughs> might as well be r comma o comma a r without a fucking oxford comma <laughs> like a mother <laughs> fuck you <laughs> So first up, we're going to recognize the message. Are we, though? No. So here's the very first sentence of this section. Quote, culture says we should be tolerant of people of all religious beliefs. And we mama bears agree, as long as we're using the correct definition of tolerance. Oh. And made up definition of tolerance in three, two, <laughs> one. Yeah. Go. To say she walks on racist eggshells here is an insult to the clumsy treatment of eggshells. She points out that, you know, blah, blah, blah. You can't kill Jews and Muslims. <laughs> but when you tell them that they're wrong and that God's going to burn them in hell forever because of those beliefs, do it nicely. Right. Yeah. There it is. Tolerance. Noun. Slur words followed by sir or madam. <laughs> but, but, but be careful because you don't want to say it too nicely. Oh, no, they don't. <laughs> they definitely don't. <laughs> Saying you're going to burn in hell too nicely is actually a big problem. In fact, as she points out for an entire paragraph, some ministries don't tell gay people they're going to hell. And, and some ministry 
build like wells and shit instead of giving people Bibles that they need. Okay. <laughs> so when you yell slur words at those ministries, you should say it nicely. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. Okay. As Catherine puts it, quote, with combined pressures of a pluralistic society and political correctness, Christians have become silent, neglecting the command to go and tell the gospel to others, end quote. Uh, pretty sure there's a few remote tribes in Brazil that would argue again, and they're dead. Never yeah, mind. well, they would have <laughs> argued. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that that's the first time anybody ever described Christians using the word silent. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so now it's time to, oh, offer discernment mm -hmm. and kathy admits that <sighs> offering discernment to pluralism is tricky i mean i like you but you're gonna burn in a lake of fire forever and i won't even entertain the thought that you won't is a tough sell but it's possible or as kathy says we love people but demolish their ideas what? <laughs> <laughs> and that brings us to lie number one sincere belief makes something true uh should we tell her <laughs> no, 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 no. let's let it go please proceed governor please <laughs> explain that it's so good kathy gets so close to finding the map on the back of the declaration of independence here it's heartbreaking <laughs> she goes into this whole long thing about how i worked at nasa and logic dictates that two conflicting statements can't both be true they can't that's logic. And so if I say that God is Christ in the Trinity and you say there's just plain old one God, one of us has to be wrong. <laughs> uh, minimum. One of them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is Actually, minimum. <laughs> Next up, line number 2B, I guess. <laughs> it doesn't matter who you worship, just that you worship. And again, mm. so close. She gets so close here. Mm, does she? <laughs> she spends the section being like, yeah, but I mean, if your beliefs are wrong, then it, it doesn't matter that you worship. I mean, hell, if your beliefs are wrong, worship is totally useless. <laughs> <laughs> or, or as she puts it, quote, worship without sound doctrine is idolatry. And it's like inventing a god and decided to worship that instead of worshiping the one true god, <laughs> end quote. <laughs> According to 70% of the world, Christianity should only be allowed because of pluralism. And that's how you... Time out. Is time, I'm taking time out. I'm taking time out. Right, no, like if a book could shoot itself in the middle of a sentence, I would be worried about this book right now. <laughs> yeah, this is the it's not loaded of chapters. <laughs> she also explains how much it pisses off God that we allow other religions in this section. She says, quote, God doesn't say... They're not worshiping me, but hey, at least they're worshiping something. No, he wants the worship to be given to him and him alone. He's a and petty Chris. fuck. Okay. <laughs> Relax. And, Come on. To Catherine's credit, she literally ends this section by pointing out that like God did tell the J Jews to massacre people with different beliefs in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. And her point is basically... I mean, so if you think about it, telling someone they're going to hell by comparison is downright neighborly. Am I right? <laughs> oh, great. So uh, we're welcome, I guess. <laughs> Which brings us to lie number three. All paths lead to God. Again, let's take this book's shoelaces before we leave it alone, right? Because now she has to point out that every single person or culture through all of history that ever thought they'd found the path to God was wrong, except her. <laughs> Yep. yep. And she only dedicates a paragraph to this one, which which I can sum up for you. Uh, it's a no, no. <laughs> she concludes by saying, quote, worship must be done in spirit and in truth. And this means worshiping God alone and having faith in Jesus alone. Just, just relax it out. Just say <laughs> it's it's mutually and, exclusive. Quote, <laughs> and I only mention this because she ends that sentence with a citation to her own book. <laughs> footnote, I bid. Me, me bid. Me bid footnote. So you're probably thinking to yourself at this point, okay, Catherine, but if the gospel is true, won't it unite everyone? Well, fuck your face because that is lie number four. The true gospel unites all people. And her point in this section, it's such a long paragraph and I really wanted to quote it, but... The point in this section is that the gospel is true and perfect, but the people suck. In fact, people suck so hard that they can interpret perfect truth 
differently. That's just <laughs> that's just how much people suck. <laughs> wow. So her literal argument is not everybody's as good as us as you and me are. <laughs> I call this the argument from unintelligent design. Hold on, just time out again. I just want one more. Time out. <laughs> so now it's time to A argue for a healthier approach. And it's worth noting that like this entire book has been dedicated to like gotchas about whatever the topic is. So like when it was postmodernism, arguing for a healthier approach meant saying, if there's no truth, is that true? But for this chapter, the so-called healthier approach is just Catherine's religion. But don't worry, according to Catherine, quote, thankfully, we can still look back to the Old Testament for some great examples of what to do. And really? Hmm. Uh, okay. Well, again, please proceed, Governor. Please <laughs> explain all the yeah. awesome morality in the Old Testament. Sadly, heads do not meet rocks. Her example is Daniel, who, if you will remember from the Bible, is offered food by a king. But Daniel tells that guy to fuck himself. In fact, Daniel tells that guy to fuck himself so hard that the king became a Jew. And that is what Catherine wants mama bears to do. Uh huh. Okay. Uh, side note on that Daniel story. If any Christians want to jump into a den of lions to prove the Bible is true, I'm there. Yeah. And I will <laughs> switch right the fuck over, ready to eat some crow on this. Some furnaces. <laughs> yeah, there's options. There's options. Yeah. She, it, it tells you a lot that she concludes this section with We must love others enough to speak the truth, even when it's unpopular. Yeah, no, like it's if we weren't protesting at those funerals, how would people even know what groups God hated? Right? <laughs> so now we're going to R, reinforce through discussion, discipleship, and prayer. And she's divided this section into how to do this with young children and middle and high schoolers. So for young children, Catherine recommends the following, quote, give some examples of opposites and explain why both cannot be true at the same time. And in the same way, relate that to differing beliefs found in other religions. Yeah, just be careful not to start with pluralism versus totalitarianism. <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, tolerance versus Christianity. Don't, yeah. don't set up opposites to fuck up my thing. Right, yeah, or Christianity and anything that ends in ology, really. Or <laughs> yeah. Ometry. She concludes, be sure that your children understand that not everyone believes in the God of the Bible and this is why we are called to tell them about Jesus. Note that she doesn't say not everyone has heard of the motherfucker, though. <laughs> <laughs> but when it comes to middle schoolers and high schoolers, though, it's time to break out the puppets. <laughs> Quote, what? Do some role playing that teaches your kids how to listen to someone else's viewpoint before countering it with their own. Oh, <laughs> Jesus With Christ. puppets? <laughs> so just holding puppets and doing nothing can, can we give the puppets mom can we just do nothing oh without them she continues pick a different religion each week and discuss the core doctrines of that religion and how it differs from christianity for help See the World Religions blog series by Lindsay at MamaBearApologetics.com. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, no, by God, by all fucking means, don't learn about those religions from their own sources. <laughs> <laughs> she concludes, most importantly, make sure your children understand why Christianity is true. For help, see my book, Teaching Others <laughs> to Defend Christianity. And for even more help, especially regarding the book height method of epistemology. See the case for Christ by Lee Strobel. <laughs> so now we're going to pause for prayer. Bear pause. Nailed it every time. Which she opens by saying, oh, quote, Jesus, you are supreme, highest in rank, sovereign, reigning above all others. I praise you because you, without question or confusion, are the one true way to reconciliation between God and man. <laughs> Always nice when your prayer starts with a Trump tweet. Yeah. <laughs> so now it's time for the discussion questions. Gentlemen, buckle in. Icebreaker. How many people of different religions? This is so fucking great. How many people of different religions have you interacted with? What, what was your interaction like? <laughs> what? <laughs> okay. Uh, before we argue some more in favor of 
totalitarian theocracy. Let's list all our Jewish friends. I think <laughs> yeah, we all have right. some. Literally. Literally. Let's list them all. <laughs> we just got this vision of a fucking gaggle of Karens sitting around asking if tax support counts. <laughs> <laughs> Two, main theme. You can seek peace with all people without having to regard all ideas as equally true. At Mama Bear Apologetics, we say to demolish arguments, not people. What is the difference between the two? Have you seen this done well? Have you seen this done poorly? Uh, poorly? Yeah. <laughs> uh, for help, see Catherine's book and also MamaBearApologetics.com yeah, right. <laughs> and the thing we're doing a segment on right now. Okay. I just have to point out this next question I'm reading word for word. I have not altered it in any way, shape, or form. Three, self-evaluation. Are you comfortable interacting with people who are different from you, whether because of <laughs> race, income, religion, sense of humor, or ellipses, question mark? <laughs> wow. What? That was a slur. That was an ellipse over a slur. You know, swear, swear. <laughs> wow. How well do you know what other religions teach? Okay, now let's everybody list our black friends and uh, uh, our friends with a New York sense of humor. Very you funny. Guys, you know, Very mm-hmm. funny people. <laughs> you, you need to get comfortable with those people before you can demolish their ideas. Yeah. That's important. Oh, geez, I love that. How racist are you on a scale of one to ten made it into our list of questions? This has been by far the most self-aware chapter in her book. Yeah. Yeah. Nine. A lot of nines. Okay. Don't worry. <laughs> All right. Now. Here we go. A process for this. All right. Number four. Brainstorm. What are some ways that you and other mama bears can practice being loving to people who hold different beliefs? Hmm. Okay, they actually gave us a pretty good answer to this one. If Christians would put on sock puppets and just shut the fuck up and not move, <laughs> that, that's a great start. Right, yeah, because we, obviously we've, we've established that books can't commit suicide. So, <laughs> <laughs> And here's my favorite one. It's how she ends the chapter. Release the bear. More than likely, there are other moms at your child's school who are very different from you and have different beliefs. Pick just one and invite her (laughs) to a lunch date. Start out by listening to her and asking questions. Get to know her as a person. Find out why she believes what she does. For helpful tips, see Hillary's short Playground Apologetics series on the Mama Bear website. Invite a noble savage on a lunch date. (laughs) Um, End of chapter. (laughs) Here's If you need help, Listening to someone and getting to know them. We wrote a blog about it. (laughs) Fuck. Oh, boy. I hope this is in Anna's future along with a hidden microphone. So with that, we're going to bring this one to a close. There's still more chapters to come, though. Between now and then, try not to linger on the nightmare that would be a missionary lunch date with one of Hillary's (laughs) readers. Before we let cool on the countertop tonight, I wanted to let everybody know that, yes, the book is still coming. We're in the middle of the I don't give a fuck if people know what it means or not. Pestiferous is the perfect word right there. Face of things. But we're hard at work getting everything in line. Uh, we're even circling around a title at this point, but we're still taking suggestions. We appreciate the ones that we've gotten so far. Anyway, that's all the blasphemy we've got for you tonight. But we'll be back in 10,022 minutes with more. If you can't wait that long, be on the lookout for a brand new episode of our sister show's hot friend, God Awful Movies, debuting at 7 a.m. Eastern on Tuesday. And an even newer episode of our half-sister show, Citation Data, debuting at noon Eastern on Wednesday. Obviously, I want to thank Heath Enright for his mellifluous contributions to this episode. I want to thank Eli Bosnick from the past for busting ass to help us get ahead for this paternity leave. I also want to thank the lovely and talented Lucinda Lusions for braving the worst of the headlines again for us this week. I also want to thank Amory, whose adopted extended family we are honored to be a part of for providing this week's Farnsworth quote. But most of all, of course, I want to thank this week's best people, Nicholas, Joe, Aaron, Brooke, Kyle, Mike, Naomi, Savannah, Andrew, and other Aaron. Nicholas, Joe, and Aaron, who are so hot you need an oven mitt to give them a hand job. Brooke, Kyle, Mike, and Naomi, whose opinions carry so much weight they affect the tides. And Savannah, Andrew, and other Aaron, who are so sexy, porn watches them. 
Together, these 10 tenacious, tender hearts have made our tendentious tendencies more tenable this week by giving us money. Not everybody has the money it takes to give us money, but if you do, you can make a per-episode donation at patreon.com slash scathingatheist, whereby you'll earn early access to an extended ad-free version of every episode. Or you can make a one-time donation by clicking on the donate button on the right side of the homepage at scathingatheist.com. And if you'd like to help, but expendable income is a thing you've only read about in the storybooks, you can also help a ton by leaving a five-star review, telling a friend about the show, and following at PIATPod on Twitter. Legal services for this podcast are provided by the law offices of P. Andrew Torres. Tim Robinson handles our social media, and our audio engineer is Morgan Clark, who also wrote all the music that was used in this episode, which was used with permission. If you have questions, comments, or death threats, you'll find all the contact info on the contact page at scathingatheist.com. Which half of the butt plug would you want to have geometrically? The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2020. All rights reserved.